So for those of you that are sort of new to this whole process, we are standing in the first half of an exhibition about the artist Salvador Dali that opened here at the museum last month. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we are closed right now, but this exhibition will open again with the museum in the first week of February. And so we are going to be delighted to um, bring you back. But in the meantime, we are doing doing a couple of different kinds of tours basically for the show. Some of them are tours about individual projects that are on view within the exhibition. Part of them are also sort of like more like quiet meditative tours of the objects. And you can find the tour that we did of the Divine Comedy just before Christmas on the museum's website now. And then you can also on the website, you can find the meditative tours where quickly going through and settling on individual images within the exhibition and allowing you time to just sort of soak it in without any sort of commentary or opinions of pesky curators like Ryan Grover or any of that sort of business. Um, so today you are stuck with pesky opinions of, of Ryan Grover, but there are other options for you as well. And Kristen gave you some ideas about upcoming projects that will be happening. Um, I will also just sort of preemptively let you know, I am not a Salvador Dali scholar. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. And I have done a lot of reading up about him and I've sort of done um, some analysis of some of the works that have come in through this sort of traveling exhibition. Um, but I do really encourage you to tune back in when David Rubin, the, um, the, the, the mastermind of this exhibition is actually coming to talk about individual pieces within the show. I think it's gonna be brilliant. I can't wait to watch that myself and for once not be the person speaking in it. But <laughs> that aside, um, this exhibition, Stairway to Heaven is um, actually two different book projects that Salvador Dali undertook, one in about 1934 and one in about 1960. So at two kind of peaks in his professional life. We have already gone through the Divine Comedy, which he did later in his career um, in an earlier program, which you can find on the website, but we're now going to be hitting on the 1934 project that he did, an illustration project that he did for an epic poem that was um, being republished in 1934 called the Songs of Maldoror, or the Chants de Maldoror, uh, Maldoror, Maldoror. Yes, and, um, and so Maldorar, the book itself was originally published in the 1860s um, by a French Uruguayan poet uh, named, uh, pen named uh, Le Comte de Lautremont, Le Comte de Lautremont, I've been practicing. And, um, and it was a very unusual kind of book for its time because it was, uh, it was an epic poem about the exploits of a truly evil person. And so, um, and it was filled with fantasy and it was filled with all of this sort of dark imagery and violence and um, these sort of corruptible characters and just really, really sort of strange kinds of interconnected um, experiences between the, within the character development of the storyline. And, um, and, in the wake of World War I within Europe, um, a group of artists that called themselves the Surrealists, both painters and sculptors, but also writers, um, rediscovered the songs of Maldorar and used it as a kind of calling card that sort of connected all of these people together under this idea of surrealism. And surrealism, if you've heard of the expression surrealist before, you may have also have heard of the expression Dada. These were different kinds of artists, mostly in Europe, that were in a way trying to come to grips with the horrors and, um, uh, well, truly the horrors that they had experienced and that the people around them had experienced during World War I. So it was a way for them to kind of put their mind psychically around the absurdity of failing states and the absurdity of uh, civilizations that fall out from underneath us and 
um, and the levels of violence that they experienced. And they're trying to understand through art the ways that people can treat each other that badly. And so, um, and so I feel like surrealism sort of comes out of this moment of intense absurdity um, within European and really world history. But it was something that seemed to have affected um, uh, everyone really substantially, but there were uh, in, entire groups of artists that sort of committed themselves aesthetically to this idea of sort of pursuing the absurd. And oftentimes some of the more harrowing and kind of um, controversial taboo, scary parts of our culture, parts of our lives, parts of our humanity. Um, so Salvador Dali, he starts off his career. So he was born in 1904. And by the mid 1920s, he is in Paris. He had already dropped out of college in Madrid twice and um, decided that there was nothing else that they could teach him. He was, technically speaking, he was kind of a romantic painter. He painted works and objects that you would easily be able to identify. He was extremely skilled craftsman, um, meaning that he was able to paint very, very well, very, very easily. Um, he was an incredible draftsman. He was able to draw elegantly and, um, he was coming up at a time when the world was being overtaken by modernism. Um, and kind of the biggest kind of sort of figure, especially in Europe at that time, was probably Pablo Picasso and the rise of Cubism. Salvador Dali, even though he owed Pablo Picasso quite a bit, Pablo Picasso actually was the person who recommended that he get this illustration process for the Songs of Maldorar. but. Aesthetically, Salvador Dali and Pablo Picasso could not have been further apart from each other. Um, they were, um, well, Salvador Dali was really kind of boisterous, really sort of out there and really put Pablo Picasso down, which I think is really funny. But um, Dali's romantic edge to painting, his sort of background and romantic painting styles really sort of lent itself to surrealism because surrealism is all about being able to identify all of the sort of components, all the symbols, all the figures, all the landscapes, and really, really like you should be able to identify them fairly easily, but you create these sort of contrasts that cause a kind of emotional discord, sort of psychic discord inside you that you don't really understand how these things come together, what they mean. And in all actuality, they might be really unsettling. Um, this was definitely true of Salvador Dali's earliest works, um, the works that we're gonna be seeing today. Um, the work that you see that are uh, illustrate the songs of Maldorar they are less to do with the actual epic poem and more to do with what Salvador Dali had been painting since the late 1920s and especially during the 1930s. Um, the thing that I really wanna sort of center on for a second is how Salvador Dali emerged with his process. This is the way sort of like, um, when we talk about process, this is the way that artists sort of approach image making, how they are creating these works. And Salvador Dali had developed what he called the paranoid critical method. This, is, um, this has been described a lot of different ways and I'm gonna try and sort of um, summarize as well as I can. Um, Salvador Dali would deliberately place himself into a trance-like state. He would focus his physical attention, his eye view, on one particular thing. Maybe it's a spot on the wall, maybe it's something in the ceiling, maybe it's a particular image, but he would focus his attention so feverishly while he was imagining the things that horrified him. Literally the things that made him disquieted, the things that gave him pause, the things that worried him, the things that kept him up at night. And in the wake of World War I, that was probably a big list. Um, but those things that caused him to create, to, to have a paranoid experience, um, to, to unsettle him emotionally. He would meditate on these imaginings in his mind while he was concentrating his gaze. And it would create images, hallucinations, literally. And those hallucinations were the focal points. They became the subjects of his artwork. Um, 
And so it is not surprising under those circumstances that we discover that a lot of the earliest work that he did had to do with his own troubled feelings about, say, his sexuality, um, troubled feelings that he had about his relationship with his parents, um, troubled relationships that he had with his own mortality. Um, People have talked quite a bit about how Salvador Dali lived under the specter of having been one of two sons who had survived. So his older brother died before he was born. I think he was, um, I think he was, I think his mother was probably pregnant with him at the time that his older brother had died. And his parents had always sort of laid on Salvador Dali that he was his brother reincarnated. Well, this messed with with him for the rest of his life. And it was one of those points that he kept coming back to. He had a very strained relationship with his father. Um, his father was, uh, was a, um, uh, a very stoic personality from what I understand, very religious and a uh, very strict personality, um, had very high expectations about what Salvador Dali should do, very specific uh, expectations of his career and what it is that he would, um, uh, that would what he would rise to become. Um, and I think Salvador Dali was uh, a surprise to him <laughs> because uh, Dali delighted in creating this mystique about him that captivated the whole world. He was, um, he was a nut, he was, he was truly mad. And, um, and I feel like part of what created such success for Salvador Dali had to do with this creation of the character of the painter Salvador Dali. So part of that creation has to do with this woman right here. And can I get you to just sort of focus in on this, this painting a little bit? Or excuse me, on this print. So now this is an etching. So this is someone has, Salvador Dali had originally created a drawing and then he transcribes that drawing into little gouges on onto a metal plate and then the plate is treated chemically and the plate then is able to, allowed to absorb ink and be put through a printing process against paper several, several, several times. So that's what you are seeing here is Salvador Dali's line work on metal transferred to paper. And so the image that we see here, the portrait is of his wife, Gala. Gala. Um, they met when Salvador Dali was in his late 20s. She was, I believe, either the wife or mistress. I believe it was the wife of one of Salvador Dali's best friends, a poet, a surrealist poet. And um, they started an affair. This is uh, 1934 was just before they were married. Gala was about 10 years older than Salvador Dali. And they had, by what we would describe today as an open relationship, they made this very, very public. And they did so by creating incredibly lavish parties filled with sexual tension, sometimes overt orgies even. And these folks reveled in the fact that they were creating this huge sensation, both in the art world, but also throughout, the, throughout Europe and eventually in America as well. Um, Gala was, and you can step back if you want to. Gala um, was a, huge influence upon Salvador Dali. She was kind of amused to him. And she is described as being very sexually provocative, that um, she was a much more experienced individual. But um, at the same time, I feel like Dali seems to have described in his, in his own autobiography that he didn't feel like he was quite up to that challenge sexually. And so, um, so there was a kind of tension between um, within this relationship that existed with a lot of individuals around them as well. Um, symbolically, Gala, the, the depiction of Gala here is actually taken from a portrait that he had created of her. And when you were close up, you may have noticed that she has a, literally a sort of raw pork chop on her shoulder. Her, she's sort of, she's kind of like musingly sort of grinning down at her shoulder. And here on her shoulder is a pork chop that has been skewered with a fork. This is Dolly's tr through and through. He is talking about, um, not only is he adoring his wife and he is a future wife, but he is also talking about the frailty of human flesh. He is talking about human sexuality. He is talking about the sort of um, 
the corporeal experience of meat and meat being sort of stabbed and penetrated. Um, he is being visceral. He is being the bad boy of European art world. And he reveled in this possibility. He created huge patron bases for himself being this bad boy personality. And he had a terrific time because of it. Um, one might say that the lifestyle that he created was as much the art form as the art that he created um, for the walls. And so, um, so you start to see this kind of, um, this, this, the importance of this, uh, this personality that emerges in his lifestyle. So this oh, actually- Ryan, We have a quick question. Yeah. 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 Um, can you elaborate on um, if that symbolism, you reference the pork chop being skewered, is that something that shows up in other artworks in this collection or throughout Salvador Dali's career? So this is a great question. And this is actually something um, I actually sort of started off with this image because it sort of sets the tempo for a couple of other things. Um, one of the things that you'll notice when you're looking at this particular image is that the, 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 the actual specimen of the meat that's on her shoulder is kind of limp. It looks like it's been sort of like um, uh, not cooked, but that it is raw and sort of just um, uh, just not keeping a shape, not keeping its form exceptionally well. And so the um this idea of sort of like the flaccid piece of meat the sort of like um lifeless piece of meat this the and the shape of sort of like um the shape this sort of amorphous kind of form that just kind of like falls to one side or just sort of languishes within a, within an image. This eventually evolves into a series of um, subjects that um, the artist starts talking about in relation to melting. So you start to see melting skulls, you start to see melting uh, clocks. And this idea of sort of like, again, this kind of cascading form this kind of arcing form that you see over her shoulder, um, we return to this over and over and over again. People might, uh, people have talked about it in terms of sort of, um, it's uh, kind of a, have talked about it in reference to a sort of phallic connection. They've also talked about it in terms of a um, uh, kind of representation of physical impotence. Um, it might also have to do with sort of creative impotence and the fear of creative impotence, um, but it is like all surreal work, inherently autobiographical. Does that help a little bit? We will see some other examples of this in the not too distant future. And I don't know how, um, I hope that my, uh, my camera ladies have a stomach for the subject matter because it, it, this is, um, I, I will try to be as uh, professional as I can about this, but this lecture is inherently a little PG-13. <laughs> so also in this subject, um, also in this image, we see some other sort of like basic components of Salvador Dali's work that are really important. Um, the landscape that you see here is taken directly from his, uh, from his, um, his origins um, from the area that he was originally from, the, uh, the, the area of Catalan in Spain. Um, and so you often see these sort of representations of these flat fields surrounded by mountain chains in a lot of his work. And this has to do with sort of like uh, basing his sort of, uh, uh, sort of like the formation, the foundations of his own personality being in that portion of Spain. Also, and this is a little bit difficult to see in this particular picture because the line work is so deep, so so um, uh, so narrow. But in the background, and we might be able to get in a little bit closer to see this. In the background, you see a couple of figures, sort of made out of these kind of silhouetted clouds, and you see the rays of sunlight coming sort of through the sky above it. Um, these figures will also play somewhat prominently in a lot of work that um, that. Salvador Dali is creating at this time. And they are based on a painting called The Angelus by Francois Millet. Um, Salvador Dali did reference a number of sort of classic French paintings, especially uh, French, some Italian paintings of the previous century. Millet is, uh, so this painting is, that's being referenced here is from 1859. And um, from what I understand, a 
print of the Malay painting was in the house that Salvador Dali had grown up with. And the way that it was sort of described to me is that the fear that was bred into Salvador Dali around the passing of his own brother and then his own sort of existential crisis related to the death of his brother and his own identity being his reincarnated soul, um, then created this obsession about the figures that were represented in the Angelus. Um, and Dali started to create this sort of theory that there was a missing figure that had been painted out of the painting, which eventually turned out to be true. Um, and so we see this man and woman in a field in Malay's painting, and they are facing one another in this sort of tense exchange, but they're both in sort of the solemn moment of prayer that seems, um, I don't know, somewhat um, disorienting given the fact that they're outside and there's this sort of streaming light behind them. And it's, um, it's a remarkable painting. You should look it up on, on, um, on the internet. But um, the, this, the, the, this imagery haunts Salvador Dali throughout his life. And so um, and you find that these sort of formative characteristics, these sort of subjects that he picks up even in his childhood, follow him almost throughout his entire career. Um, and so Gala is one of those, the landscape of Catalan is one of those, the Angelus is one of those. And this, um, this idea of sort of penetrating meat forms, this sort of, uh, the, the, the sort of limp form is, um, it's, it's, it's an important char characteristic of a lot of his work. So we've centered on that one entirely too long. And I'm just gonna bring you around the corner here. Brian? Yeah. Um, I have one more very quick question. Go for it. Um, so can you tell us, uh, in our last tour and in half of the exhibition, we actually have a lot of artworks that are, um, uh, they are fully colored. Um, can you elaborate on why the ones that we're seeing right now are black and white, or if there are other colored pieces as part of this uh, collection in La Chance de Maldoro? Um, the, the exhibition is made up of actually two different publications. The, um, the colored images, the images that um, are brightly colored and, um, and uh, they are prints that were created um, using a process called woodblock prints. And they are um, uh, several different sort of, a, a series of different kinds of wooden matrices um, cut in order to be able to print different sections, different colored forms of each print. And the, um, the prints, um, sometimes they take 20 and 30 individual blocks to create an individual image, but every, um, every block represents a different color. So you create an inherently very, very bright, very vibrant sort of set of images. Um, the Divine Comedy, the one that, um, the, the second half of this exhibition, uh, the project that was done in 1960, uh, that is done with this woodblock process. The process that we're looking at here with etching is simply black ink using metal plates on paper. So this is a completely different publication process, but the thing that I really, really admire so much about this particular project has to do with the fact that you get to see Salvador Dali as the draftsman. These are Salvador Dali's lines. These are his hand creating this plate. And you will be able to see the quality of line, the sort of um, the use of perspective that he is able to create, um, the attention that he is able to give to portraiture and anatomy and, um, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. It's also a really nice way to sort of set up for the divine comedy images when you visit the exhibition. Does that answer the question, Kristen? Yes, thank you. Awesome. So because this is a book project, we've set these up so that each set of prints 
opens up the way that the book would. So you're looking at two different pages of the book, but thankfully they're really nice looking pages. And so um, we're gonna focus on this image on the right here. And I'm gonna see if I can get onto the side here. And what we're looking at is a really stylized skeleton figure. You can kind of make out that this figure, here are the rib cages and the figure is kneeling. So here is the right leg, here is the left leg, here are basically just kind of a stylized pelvic bone rib cages and the figure is uh, without arms or head. But I want you to notice that the figure is covered in these sort of limp forms, these kind of almost kidney shaped draping forms all throughout, even here at the sort of pubis area. Um, you sort of see it penetrating a kind of donut shape and the body is, somewhat vital, the shapes that you see in the upper portion of the body are whole, nothing is broken, nothing is damaged, but they are falling and they are sort of draping. And ultimately at the bottom of the page, you start to see that the leg, the second leg, the one, um, the, the left leg of the figure is actually in a state of decomposition. Um, this is plate five of the, the Songs of Maldor and what we're seeing here when we're looking at the, the idea of sort of the decaying skeleton has to do with um, issues around human frailty, about uh, cycles of life, um, sort of uh, being concerned ultimately with death and the presence of death. Um, what's also interesting about this piece though is that this particular image is uh, taken directly from a painting that uh, that Salvador Dali had done the same year as this, um, as this uh, illustration project, um, that what is called the Imperial Monument to the Child Woman, which, um, so there is this sort of genuflecting of this sort of kneeling skeleton figure in front of this mountain that is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a stylized, a mountain representation, again, of his wife, Gala. And, um, and so, this is ultimately an homage to Gala. It is sort of a stand-in for this larger painting, sort of playing with these ideas or, and repurposing them for a myriad of different, different things. But the presence of these kind of draping figures also plays with the sort of notion of his fears around sexuality, around female anatomy, and around um, uh, sort of his expectations of what it is that he's supposed to experience sexually. He did say at one time that he um, became very obsessed with masturbation very early, and but also recognized that he was not as well endowed as other individuals that were around him. And so he always had this sort of, um, he described that he always had this sort of sense of a sort of like physical failing in relation to other men. But at the same time, he was still actively engaging with the body. So I, um, I, one is the, these stories are so difficult to sort of make out, like you, it's really hard to understand how much of this is part of the show, how much of this is being sort of sensationalized for the purpose of attention and selling art and creating this, this, this mystique. But at the same time, he's also sort of laying himself out to be a very vulnerable person talking here in the 1930s about his own sexuality. So, um, it's, uh, it, one can well imagine just how sensational this sort of storyline would have been. Um, we are going to move a little bit further down the way here. And we're going to stop on a, um, on a print that's called this, uh, excuse me, um, this is uh, plate 11 from the Songs of Maldorar, but it's uh, based on a painting called The Spectre of Sex Appeal. Um, this is one of a number of prints and paintings done in the 1930s where Salvador Dali ostensibly sort of represents himself in the painting, or excuse me, in the, in the composition. And here we see Salvador Dali as a small child holding a, um, a sort of toy hoop, completely overwhelmed, dominated by these monumental figures of a fairly healthy but extremely stylized female figure here, and then another extremely stylized female figure in a state of decay here on top of this sort of examination table. 
in the background, again, we see the sort of reference to the Catalonian landscape. Um, sometimes the figure of the child is accompanied by a father figure. Um, but what I think is interesting here is that the tiny Salvador Dali places himself within this female power, this sort of this, this dominating female imagery as this small, inferior, um, helpless kind of figure. The bodies of the women, or women-like figures, I guess I should say, because they're really sort of too heavily abstracted to be able to call them any sort of, um, to call them women. But these sort of stylized female figures um, really absolutely dominate the scene and they obscure the presence of the artist, which um, uh, must psychologically, I, would, I, I think people have argued that this psychologically gives you an indication of how he felt in relation to women's power, women's bodies um, and women's sexuality. Um, we also see another sort of important artistic characteristic in this work. Um, you probably noticed the body was being held up with Salvador Dali's characteristic um, crutches. He would use the crutch form, the sort of Y-shaped wooden form that um, branches out and cups to be able to hold different parts of the body or other parts of the, comp the, the artist's composition up into um, a sort of more somewhat stable sort of position. Um, the, the, um, the crutches have often described sort of a grounding effect within his surrealist imagery within that sort of um, that universe of symbolisms um, that it sort of grounds you to the earth that it grounds you to the present that it doesn't allow the figure to become too over the top too late in my opinion, but you know, <laughs> Salvador Dali thought it was helping to keep him grounded. It would help to um, uh, force him to think about his subjects within, in terms of the history of image making, um, that it would help to sort of um, ground them into history. Um, but that there was also sort of a negative part about this, that the crutches were used to also maintain a tradition, that there was something that was being maintained here that perhaps maybe shouldn't be. Um, the representation of the female body here, um, I feel that this is sort of controversial. I think that this is sort of, um, and it's, I think it's interesting um, how artists over time do represent the body um, and, here we see the women, um, the women's buttocks as well as their breasts have been sort of elongated and turned into almost missile-like forms, um, ex extremely exaggerated. And then the larger of the two female forms, um, the upper torso is in a state of decay. Um, the sort of the chest has been tied and bound. Um, there's uh, there's a kind of tension with the idea of womanhood here that um, that is, you know, honestly, it's kind of disturbing and plays back into that paranoid critical method that sort of um, uh, allowing yourself to be haunted basically with the imagination of the, of the things that you fear. Um, and it seems that his fear is really heavily manifest um, in his representation of himself in relation to these female, uh, to these sort of powerful female sort of um, elements. This way. I was really delighted to find out that in this show, we actually do have a melting clock within the composition. Um, now, many of you I'm sure have uh, become familiar with the painting, The Persistence of Memory. It's the composition with the two melting clocks, or actually, I think there are actually several of them. One is melting over top of an exam table, another is melting over an olive tree. There is the sort of Spanish landscape in the background, the Catalonian landscape. And we have a kind of um, a simplified version of that, of, of that um, subject matter here within plate 15 of the songs. So again, you had the exam table, but the clock melting here, even with this sort of knife form here. Now he had, again, and it's hard to really tell what's, um, what's honestly true, what's absolutely happening, but Salvador Dali had stated that the idea of the melting clock had come from the observation of a piece of camembert cheese 
that he observed when he on a particularly hot day. Um, take it with a grain of salt, but the idea of the melting clock is supposed to sort of, um, uh, it has sort of a dual purpose. One thing has to do with sort of this, um, this, this very consistent notion of impotent forms of, um, of sort of um, shapeless forms. And then also his notion of the malleability of space and time. Um, as we get sort of further along in Salvador Dali's career, and this becomes really, really heavily evident with the Divine Comedy, the other half of the exhibition, um, Salvador Dali gets really, really interested in the perception of science and the, um, the notion of space, the cosmos, the universe, um, and also becomes somewhat obsessed with this notion of time. And I think what he's talking about with this idea of sort of melting clock is that while the notion that uh, time is something that can be defined, that we also sort of count on, that we know that it's this element of the universe, um, and at the same time, our perception of it can be so different from person to person. Um, what happens for one group of, what happens for one person may not necessarily be what happens the way that other individuals would see the same kind of subject matter and um, over a per particular period of time. And so the, the idea of the clock ultimately has to do with mortality, I think. And I mean, I think it ultimately has to do with his own perception of how much time we have and what that means to who we are within the universe. We are going to try and move just a little bit further on to one of my favorite, favorite pieces in the work, in the show. Um, and it's also one of the creepiest. I should have given this tour on, um, on Halloween. So we're gonna be looking at the left hand image here and this is plate 19. Um, I should point out this particular portion of the exhibition has about 40 or so individual images. And so um, we're only gonna see a few of them. So definitely make plans to come back and see the rest of the show when you get a chance. Somehow, I started doing some sort of exercise on my watch three minutes ago and didn't even know it. So um, the only thing I was um, exercising was my mouth, but <laughs> what are you gonna do? Um, so now that you've had just a second to sort of meditate on this, again, we sort of see the idea of the sort of characteristic Spanish landscape, the Catalonian landscape, but we have two human-like figures here. One is a child that has been placed onto the platform of a sewing machine. The sewing machine is doing the work of actually penetrating the child's head, perhaps fixing something there. And at the same time, there is an older figure here with the melting clock over, his, over the crest of his head who is literally sort of nibbling on the child. <laughs> the elongated head, both have enormous heads, but with the elongated head being held up with the crutch. The sewing machine is being um, uh, operated with a pair of sort of decaying hands, what have been described as sort of decaying female hands, but I don't know if you can actually say that. Um, wow. Wow, <laughs> not for the faint of heart, but very much, um, again, sort of uh, based on a painting called um, The Average Fine and Invisible Harp of 1932. Now, the sewing machine was actually sort of borrowed from the Thumbs of Maldoror poem itself, one of the rare instances that Salvador Dali actually referenced some of the symbolism from the poem itself. So this idea or the sort of um, visualization of this sort of cannibalistic act that we see in this particular image, this is a subject matter that the artist comes back to time and time again. There are these sort of references to men eating one another. There is Occasionally, um, art historians have kind of record, uh, um, have talked about a kind of homosexuality, sort of um, uh, sort of act of homosexuality being visualized within this act. Um, uh, this 
might also have to do though with the ways that individual humans can treat each other in particular, particularly badly. Sort of the ways that we sort of take advantage of one another, the ways that we literally consume one another when things are terrible. But Salvador Dali himself in his own self and in his um, autobiography, again, take it with a grain of salt, but he has actually referenced this idea that he himself became so excited sometimes with new ideas or new references or new personalities or with um, meeting new individuals um, that, that gave him such excitement that he actually talked about wanting to eat them, wanting to sort of like absorb who they were, wanting to collect them. And so we, and perhaps like so many of us, um, our, our, the, the, what we actually are seeing here might be sort of a combination of those things. Um, Dolly, I'm sure many of you have probably seen images and we definitely have a few references here within the, um, both sides of the exhibition about the, um, the human body in Dolly's paintings and prints um, opening up to chests of drawers or cabinet doors that open or this idea of sort of something being hidden within the body. And oftentimes that's associated with his friendship and also his great admiration for Sigmund Freud. Um, the, the, the imminent psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst. And so sometimes when I see these sort of elongated heads or these, um, these bodies that are um, kind of stuffed with extra material that have been exaggerated, it makes me wonder about what is hiding within the form, what is, what is meant to be symbolized as lurking within this elongated head that is literally being supported, that's literally being sort of crutched up by tradition. Um, it's uh, it's sort of a compelling question, and I wonder what um, what Dolly himself would have said about what sort of secrets are hiding within these figures. Hi, Ryan. We have a question. Good. Um, this particular image that you're looking at right now, do you know um, how, if at all, it is directly related to the sh the chant? Um, so there is a reference to the use of a sewing machine in the Songs of Maldorar. Um, and I, I can't quite remember what, it had something to do with the main character with Maldorar and a sewing machine, and there was another person involved with it. But it was not the, the, the action that you see sort of rep represented here. It was more just sort of a sort of um, observation that the sewing machine was there. And it seemed that Salvador Dali, um, in this one instance, took from that symbolism from the Songs of Maldorar and included it within the illustrations. This is uncharacteristic with the body of work that you see here. Almost never in any other examples does the work represent the Songs of Maldorar in terms of sort of um, illustrating the action of those scenes. Wonderful, thank you. You bet. So I have one more image that I wanted you to see. And this is kind of coming full circle for us. And it's the um, image that you see up above here. And if we have a couple of minutes, I'll probably send um, our camera folks um, to sort of picture a few more images after this as well. But um, I'll get you through sort of analyzing some of these first ones and maybe we'll just be able to allow you to sort of meditate upon a few others. Um, this I think was one of the better examples of Salvador Dali's reworking of Francois Millet's The Angelus of 1859. And the two figures that you see here, the female, conceivably the mother figure, as well as the male figure, um, these two show up over and over and over again in his printed work as well as within his paintings. The sort of, the tension, he even wrote about these folks, the tension that sort of is created between these two characters sort of facing one another within this empty field. Now, Salvador Dali for this particular representation also includes within this picture images by another work um, by Millet, the gleaners. So you can see this group of women in the background that are literally sort of picking stones and potatoes. And I think the gleaners are sort of known for picking up coal, potatoes, and any other kind of materials that have been discarded in the landscape and sort of surviving off of this. Um, the subject of gleaners became a really important kind of subject in a lot of um, 
uh, French realist painting of the last part of the 19th century. And so, um, so he's borrowing from this notion of the gleaners here. And at the same time, we also have a 19th century representation of Napoleon in the background, Napoleon on horseback, victorious. So, um, and uh, there's no other way to get around it than to say that Salvador Dali was fascinated by fascist rulers. He, he seemed, I don't know that he actually had political leanings one way or another, but he seemed to tolerate fascism just fine and uh, seemed to, um, and got into a lot of hot water because of it. Um, he didn't seem to have the same kind of uh, visceral, visceral and um, ethical problems that people have with fascist rule and saw it firsthand in Spain with Franco. Um, while other um, Spanish artists of that period fled Spain, he ended up moving back under Franco's rule um, to Spain with Gala and, um, and was there. Um, and did not out um, did not um, speak out against uh, did not speak out against Franco and Franco's rule during that period of time. Um, so a super super complicated set of images um, superimposed into one composition. But again, sort of talks in a way about sort of those sort of uh, gentle origins of the artist, those kinds of um, those images that he started out with that kind of haunted him throughout his life. And then also folds in these other kinds of subjects that also haunted him, these sort of subjects of war, of pestilence, of um, poverty, of, um, of loss and, um, and so many of the other subjects that kind of fueled his images during this time period. He was kind of a sad figure at this point. Um, he was brilliant. He was a great, I mean, he was a beautiful painter, um, but a lot of the work is kind of a downer <laughs> and, um, and, and honestly just a little bit frightening um, and is sort of adored for that now. But at the same time, he was not painting to create beauty per se but to explore sort of darker uh, characteristics of human nature. Um, this changes in the Divine Comedy um, with the work that he did later in his career. He starts to follow on his instincts in admiration of science. He follows in his instincts and, or I should say his origins with Catholicism. He actually sort of comes back to Catholicism in a way, um, even though he sort of positioned himself to be completely heretical during his youth. He, in his uh, 40s, 50s and 60s, once he has been literally kicked out of surrealism because of his apparent support of fascism, um, he comes back to this place where he, grew up in, which is sort of an admiration for religious observance and, um, and an attempt to incorporate a lot of Catholic religious imagery within his own work. Um, the work becomes brighter, it becomes lighter, the subject matter becomes way less intense, much less sexually um, charged. Um, he seems to become a much more confident person in himself and at the same time um, on a road to kind of moral redemption after kind of a savage youth. Um, I feel like I might have horrified you enough. This is sort of my anti-Christmas lecture this year, but, um, but I'm glad you came. <laughs> Let me ask if anybody has any more questions about the show, about the way that we've presented the show, um, about any of the images that you've seen. Um, and maybe while we're doing that, we'll just sort of scan through some other parts of the exhibition. if you guys could see what I could see. So this whole operation right now is being supported by the longest orange extension cord. And I'm dragging these four folks all over the gallery. They're having the worst time with me. Um, I might get fired at the end of this, but I don't care. Hi, Ryan. Um, yeah. We have a question. Um, can people visit the show in person? They will be able to sh um, visit the show in person in February. We um, are, 
finding ways now to be able to extend the exhibition by another couple of weeks in February. So um, we will get back to you with an updated dates on that. Um, if you wanted to though, you can get a hold of Kristen. Um, I believe that a few individuals have done this so far and you can request one-on-one -on -one tours of the exhibition with me or with other staff members. Um, I think that there is sort of a paid cost to that because you know it's because I'm hanging out with you. But at the same time, we will work with anybody who's interested in seeing more about this exhibition in any way that we can. But by all means, plan to come see the show. Kristen, did we have any other questions? That's the only question we have right now. Here's one. Um, oh. Ryan, do you have a favorite piece of art in this section? In this particular section? Um, I really liked the one where the guy was eating the baby on the sewing machine. I think that, that was hysterical. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, do um, but I am really really partial to a lot of the melting figures, um, sort of the melting forms. I just think it's fascinating this idea, you know. So many, so many, so often, especially with romantic painters, they're the forms that you create are often trying to create this kind of like stacked composition where um, triumphant figures are heroic above a landscape and other individuals so, sort of supporting figures. And Salvador Dali sort of twists this whole kind of visual narrative on its edge and creates all these sort of limp and languorous and decaying and dying and um, and ultimately very, very human forms. And, um, and I feel like the melting clock and those kind of um, abstracted kind of wiggly little worms and these kind of um, flaccid looking penis shapes and stuff like that. I just, I just dig them. I think that they're so cool um, in comparison to so much of the, so many of the traditions that he came out of. Um, so it's, um, it's just interesting to sort of see these kind of, um, these kind of contrasts within the show. Um, we have two more quick questions. Yeah. Um, the first pertains uh, immediately to this and it is, have you read La Chance de Maldoro? And the other one is, are there pieces from the Divine Comedy? So um, the first question, have I read La Chance de Maldoro? I have not. I was trying to find an American, or excuse me, an American, an English version of the poem when I was preparing for this. And then um, I wasn't able to catch one pretty easily. And then when I got the show up, I just kind of stopped looking. But I should keep looking for it because it sounds terrifying. Maldoro at one point gets into this total like standoff with a female shark because he's been dropped in the ocean as one does. And eventually, they end up in an amorous relationship. And, you know, I love sharks. I could watch, I could read about that. So um, these are the kinds of sort of zany kind of mayhem that uh, Mel Gerard gets himself into within the poems and or within the poem. And I think that it would be really interesting to, um, it, you know, if I was able to have audiences here, if I was able to have people around me, um, I feel like I would have been sort of push to go a little bit further in terms of sort of what we could do with, with our education. And wouldn't it be fun to have done sort of like um, uh, spoken word sort of presentations about the songs of Mel Durar, or to be able to um, have uh, read certain um, excerpts from the, um, the Divine Comedy while we were actually sort of taking in the images. Um, but I just feel like it wouldn't have had the same presence online, so I didn't push it. But um, but I hope that you will enjoy the ways that you can enjoy the show because it's just such, it's, it's, it's such a delight to be able to have it here. Now, you also had a question about whether or not there were something from the Divine Comedy. What was that question again? Uh, the question just asks, and I believe it's about the exhibition as a whole, are there pieces from the Divine Comedy? Oh yes, all 100 images of the Divine Comedy as Salvador Dali created it to, um, to accompany that publication's reprinting in 1964, I think it was, all 100 images are here. This is a big show that you, um, you, will, you will be able to spend some time here for sure. 
We have no more questions on this end, Ryan. All right. Thanks, guys. It was great seeing you guys.